Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest, a returning guest, probably my most, the, the guest that I've had the most conversations with. His name is Ken Ami. He's a very prolific author and blogger on his uh, website, which is truefreethinker.com. He's done so much great, fantastic research and written these very timely, important books. And uh, I've already had two discussions with him. Uh, the first discussion was about his book, the apocryphal Jesus. Um, we had that, uh, you know, a couple, three months ago, maybe. And then last month we talked Alistair Crowley's influence on pop culture, how an obscure occultist influences culture from beyond the grave. That was about Alistair Crowley's influence on music and TV and kind of anime and things like that. So uh, on tonight's show, we're going to talk uh, about another book he has published. The title is From Zeitgeist to Poltergeist, A Consideration of Richard Dawkins' Polemics regarding atheism, communism, Nazism, and evolution. So there's a lot there to consider. Uh, I've read about half the book. It's a great book, very well researched. Um, he makes some terrific points that we're gonna go over tonight. So Ken Ami, welcome to the show. Pleased to be with you again, Ken, um, William. Every time, it's just such a pleasure. Likewise, man, it's great talking to you. You know, there's, you just have such a great referential knowledge and these books are, are really wonderful, timely books. So I hope that people will take time out, go to Amazon, uh, dot com and take a look at all your books. They're definitely well worth reading, just like this one. But uh, you know, talk a little bit about yourself if you can to the audience, and uh, then and talk a little bit about how you came to this uh, book about Richard Dawkins and other atheists. Well, the relevant portion of my background is I, I actually thought about this ahead of time is to mention how I ended up becoming active online. And it was precisely because I was listening to lectures by atheists and debates with atheists, and I just could not believe the kind of stuff that they were getting away with. I mean, logical fallacies, historical blunders, just inaccurate information right and left. And it made me want to put something out there and start writing about um, the incredible amount of misinformation that these guys were putting out there. Interesting. And that, that was really my the first thing I started doing online, and it really just kind of grew and grew and grew from there. So Richard Dawkins has definitely been on my radar for a long time, and that is the premise of the book, is mostly him and secondarily Sam Harris, what they have to say about communism and Nazism with relation to Christianity. And, what, uh, and for people who aren't familiar with, Richard Dawkins and Sam Harris, can you talk a little bit about their backgrounds or the relevant books, if you recall any offhand? Sure. Richard Dawkins is retired now, but he was the, his title was the, pub, uh, the Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford University, where he also taught biology. I would say he was teaching evolution, which are two very different things, but um, his final title was that, the, the interesting title, Public Understanding of Science. Of course, what he really was doing is being the professor of the public understanding of atheism. I mean, <laughs> right, so there's a right. correlation between Darwinism and atheism. Right, and Okay, I mean, I understand that if he was teaching um, biology, he was definitely doing a lot. He's very well known, actually, for his ability to elucidate biological functions and to make them really interesting to learn about. And I think that's actually wonderful. Um, but when you listen to him or read him with a discerning eye, you recognize where he is making scientific statements and then where he's trailing off into statements based on an evolutionary worldview philosophy. Right. He has stated that Darwin made it possible to be an intellectually. Well, I, I came to realize that what he really meant by that is that he is intellectually satisfied by weaving together uh, Victorian era tall tales about how things might have been or how they came to be and how they happen, and to him that's intellectually satisfying. And a lot of people confuse that for being science. See, there's this like intermixing, that's the problem, is there's this 
mixing together of actual science with opinion and philosophy and worldviews and uh, schools of thought, uh, attempts to protect one's preferred theories. And the discerning reader really needs to ask all along the way, either reading or listening, what part of this is actual science that's observable and repeatable, and what part of it is philosophy. It's like uh, storytelling. There's definitely a lot of that and the kind of things he says. So sure. going down the line, let's say uh, in the late 70s, selfish gene was a very book by Dawkins. Then the book. You're coming in and out there. If there's a way to kind of. And, uh, right. I mean, the, the most popular recent one, of course, is the God delusion. And that's where Dawkins uh, really, really stepped well beyond his field of field of expertise, his field of schooling, and decided to take on uh, theological issues. Now, um, what I found interesting is when the book was first coming out, he said, you know, people are going to read this book and go are going to convert away from theism because of it. Then he said, well, you know, fence sitters are going to definitely become atheists. And then eventually he ended up saying that it was a book that was meant to be, quote unquote, funny, amusing. His words. So, <laughs> you know, I mean, it, it, yeah, it was going to be like a, a book that would just convert you on the spot. And then eventually when it, you know, obviously got so absolutely beat up. Um, on logical and theological and historical and scientific terms that he ends up saying, well, you know, it was meant to be funny. And After he gets kind of caught in all of these fallacies, correct? I'm sure. <laughs> Especially since retiring, he's basically been a professional atheist, right? Uh, he's and, a, uh, I mean, in very public, yeah. He's on in all kinds of lectures and people have him on his shows to discuss his positions. Then, then, uh, okay. Oh, I was just going to say. So, I mean, and then how? And then you would. So you addressed some of his kind of positions regarding these kind of fascist movements. Uh, you know, uh, Nazism, communism, and uh, can you kind of lead us on into that? Sure. Let me. Uh, let's not forget to um, introduce Sam Harris real fast. Okay. And, um, yeah. So. Sam Harris, another pop atheist, you know, he. You're coming in and out there. He has a closer microphone. Okay. Yeah. Hmm? Are you saying to be close or not be close? I don't know. I don't know what's happening, but you're definitely coming in and out of transmission. Okay. Good. I'm just sitting here barely moving, so I'm not sure what the issue is. Okay. Maybe it's just the connection. I can hear you fine, though. Okay. So Sam Harris. Okay. I'll just, yes. So Sam Harris states that he became an activist atheist on 9-11, right? As soon as he perceived that the attacks upon America were caused by theism, that's when he decided he's going to become an atheist activist, right? He was an atheist before, but now he's going to be an activist. Because theism that, leads to acts of violence, right? Exactly. Well, his main book that he wrote on the subject is called The End of Faith, Terror, and the Future of Reason. So that's his point right there. And us, religion leads to terror, and the future has to be a future of reason. Gotcha. And it tells you <laughs> right there exactly what it is. He has an interesting background. Um, I often say that he is... A a deist, but he doesn't like the term mystic, he doesn't like the term Buddhist, and he doesn't like the term atheist when applied to himself. <laughs> he, he, was, he, was, he was raised in a very sad uh, way, and he had uh, experiences with hallucinogenics and this and that, and eventually um, became a neuroscientist not too long ago, a few years ago. I can't help 
but pointing out that he's a pseudo scientist, right? He technically he's a neural scientist, but I call him a pseudo scientist because I know for a fact, based on his statements, that he came into the science with a preconceived notion in mind. So what he's doing is biased based on his atheist worldview. So let me just give you an example. This is before he was a scientist. Um, Edge, the World Question Center, asked him the following in 2005. What do you believe is true even though you cannot prove it? Okay, he says, what I believe that I cannot prove is that belief is a content-independent process, which is to say that beliefs about God to the degree that they are really believed are the same as beliefs about numbers, penguins, tofu, or anything else. And what he goes on to talk about is once the neurobiology of belief becomes clear and it stands revealed as an all-purpose emotion arising in a wide variety of contexts, so you can right. see he's already expressing his interest in neurobiology, and he says when this happens, we will then have additional scientific reasons to declare that mere feelings of conviction are not enough when it comes time to talk about the way the world is. And understanding belief at the level of the brain may hold the key to new insights into the nature of our minds and so on. It's a long quote. I'm just pulling parts just to prove that he got into neuroscience with a preconceived notion that through that science, he's going to be able to disprove theism straight up. Right. I mean, he's truly an empiricist. I mean, he's coming in as an empiricist. The only thing that you can perceive is from your own sensory experience, thus the brain or whatever, the neurobiology, right? Belief comes from the brain. Isn't that right? Do you agree with that position? Right. Yes. And, and that based on his atheistic presupposition. Right. Gotcha. Which so, is something he can't prove. So. <laughs> well, I mean, we can get into that. These guys have some in, but Sam Harris is a very popular public intellectual. He has very popular or well, kind of, you know, within yeah, the community and people go on his podcast. I've seen him on Joe Rogan. He's explained his positions. I've heard some of his stuff and a lot, you know, he actually devolved all this stuff down to like racism down to Hitler, which is kind of a, I would say is a no, no when you're discussing any topic, but we're going to get into Hitler too. But, um, well, when it comes down to it, Sam Harris blames the Holocaust on the Jews. Really? That's interesting. Yeah, and I'm, I'm not just saying that as some kind of conclusion. He straight up made that claim. So we've talked a little bit about Dawkins, talked some about Harris, and then you know their kind of positions are, I would say, somewhat similar, right? wouldn't you? That they're empiricist and that belief is takes place in the brain. There's nothing outside of human perception. So what... Uh, oh, uh, William, William. Yeah, go for it. You just cut out for about 30 seconds. I mean, I heard nothing. Well, I nothing. was I was definitely had you on mute. So, I mean, I was definitely letting, ah, you, talk. I was letting you talk. Well, but mute should be that I can't be heard, but I couldn't hear you at all. Interesting. Well, we'll see it how, how it comes. I can edit all this stuff out. I usually edit these yeah, programs I anyway, but yeah, I know. it's never perfect. But did you hear me talk, say talk about Dawkins and, and uh, Harris? So let's talk about Richard Dawkins and his polemics regarding, I mean, he's obviously an anti-Christian, anti-religion. It's not reason, you know. Um, then right. he, you know, these, these, he kind of imputes that to communism, Nazism, that they are, I mean, they're not, yeah. I mean, it, he believes that Nazism or Hitler was also kind of a Christian, that that was the, the actual real, kind of uh, impetus behind a lot. I mean, he was partially looking out. He had, Kridler supposedly had a Christian worldview. Would you agree with that? That's Dawkins' position? Yes, that is Dawkins' position. Well, that's ridiculous. I mean, I think that, uh, you know, according to my research on Hitler, he knew all these dates. He knew all kinds. He was an astrologist. He, you know, talked to, I mean, you record a lot of these statements in his book, uh, in your book that are, I think, remarkable many of which I wrote down, but like, uh, here's, here's something by Google, Goebbels. The Fuhrer is deeply religious, though completely anti-Christian. He views Christianity as a symptom of decay, rightly so. It is a branch of the Jewish race. 
atheist. No, no, he wasn't. He was an atheist. No, no, he's on our camp. No, he's on ours. <laughs> but of course, no, <laughs> nobody wants to claim Hitler, right? So mm -hmm. in that case, Christians claim he's an atheist, and atheists claim he's a Christian. Frankly, I'm not convinced he was a, either. I know for sure he wasn't a Christian. I'm not even convinced he was a, an actual atheist. And so the argument, which I've had about a hundred times, goes, well, Hitler was a Christian. Oh, well, how's that? Well, because he claimed to be a Christian. <laughs> As if that's any kind of criteria, you know. Right. Um, I know we live in an era of... Um, self-definitions and self-affirmations and but i'm sorry you are not a christian just because you claim that you are and then sometimes you'll be directed to various statements that, that hitler made in which he's affirming that he views what he's doing as you know being in line with christianity and jesus and the lord and all this and so i always wonder well the person that, that's telling me that uh, they're they're obviously presupposing that Hitler is such a honest and trustworthy guy that right. if he said it, then by golly, I believe it, and that settles it. Uh, yeah, it's selective. It's kind of a selective analysis too, because it fits in with their outlook, right? I mean, they, uh, adhere to some statements and ignore the rest. That's right. Because see, what I would do is I would read his statements, but then I would consider his actions, and that's what really tells me what he really believed because jesus says you will know them by their fruits not right. you by will know acts, them by, by their, their title you will know them right yeah. by their acts you shall know them yeah and so you also have to keep in mind like you mentioned uh, just before the show started that he was a politician and politicians say whatever is convenient at any given time true okay and another thing is um, Hitler was in the public eye for a very long time. I mean, he was he fought in World War One, right? He right. takes us all the way through to the, the end of World War II. Uh, that's very many years in a politician's life. So what are we talking about? The Hitler of the early 30s, of the mid 30s, of the late 30s, of the 40s? I mean, that's a good point. Sometimes, yeah, sometimes you have to say, well, when, in what context did he say what he was saying? Because you you find that he contradictory statements and they may may be contradictory because they were said years apart. Or for instance, some people say Hitler was pro abortion and other people say Hitler was pro life. Well he was both. Pro abortion of non Aryans, but he's against abortion of Aryans. <laughs> right. Right? I mean he's he's against Catholicism when it's convenient, he's pro Catholicism when it's convenient. That's right. just how it goes. Right. Whatever and, serves his, his positions or ideas, yeah. Right. I mean, so he, I would he, find yeah. it I would find it um, literally impossible to believe that the world's most infamous anti Semite considered a Jewish man to be his Lord God and Savior. Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean in he, the interesting thing is he interpreted Christ as at least in, in one of his writings as somebody fighting against the Jews. And I mean, I think you you wrote in your book that he didn't believe that Christ right. was Jewish, right? So that's the way he interpreted Christ. So it wasn't anything truly. I mean, it was a perversion of the biblical narrative, right? Because at that point, you either need to start mythologizing and claiming that Jesus was not Jewish, or saying that he was the true Jew, and the other Jews, such as Pharisees, were not really Jewish; they were false. You have to start playing all these games. But right. the bottom line is that Hitler is within the cultural background of the German theologians who basically de deconstructed the Bible according to their own worldview philosophies. And so what happens is what you end up in Germany is a movement called positive Christianity, which is, you know, the Christianity missing all the stuff that would actually make a Christian. Yeah. And, and it's like a and it's so, like a positive name too. Like this is the positive stuff. Let's excise all these other statements. Right. And so even if every day of his life Hitler said I'm a Christian, you would have to say, well, define that for me. What, what does it mean to be a Christian? Because it, uh, the, the Reich churches that were being established move the Bible and replace it with Mein Kampf. And so, you, what kind of Christian church is that? Right. 
Absolutely. Right. That's it. I mean, positive Christianity was involved all kinds of racial purity laws and ideas, Nazi ideology. Yeah. So it's kind of, it was basically something like maybe you'd see here in the States among white supremacist, you know, I forgot this one group, but like they, you know, turned Christ into, into an Aryan. Yeah. You know, something which is a joke. Um, and so you can't just go by labels and titles and words. You have to dig into the definition and that, would sometimes require you to know something about the historical and cultural background. Yeah, I agree. Like I, I can't tell you – now, I'll grant you this is low-hanging fruit kind of stuff, but I can't tell you how many times I've had atheists tell me, oh, yeah, oh, but, 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 but the belt buckles. You know, the right. belt that buckles said all. God be dudes, right? It said God with us. Oh, so that means that they were Christians because – God because of one thing yeah and you wrote in your book that that was actually pre Hitler so that was something from uh, the Prussian army or something like that right right it, it, over and how, I don't know how that matters anyway like if if I wear a belt buckle from the professional rodeo is the organization does that make me a cowboy right I mean seriously this is just what it comes down to proving to me is that Nazi propaganda is alive and well today because people just keep on repeating it. Right. Good point. Yeah, that's right. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's everybody else's fault. Yeah. No, I mean, it's all there. I mean, but if so, you look at the acts of Hitler, he did, he broke all his, these treaties that he had, the Ribbentrop Molotov agreement invaded Russia. I mean, he really to all that stuff with pieces of paper, the agreement with the English British, you know, Neville Chamberlain, all those things were broken. Didn't care anything about that. So all these agreements that he promised to, he didn't even adhere to. Um, so, yeah, more in line with do what thou wilt than uh, anything having to do with Christian inaction. You know? Okay, we're back. I'm uh, talking again with Ken and me, talking about uh, the positions of noted atheist and Darwinist Richard Dawkins regarding Christianity, communism, Nazism, and uh, kind of the modern kind of uh, 20th century and these these cataclysmic events that took place. So we kind of were got to talking about Dawkins and his opinion and, and his ideas about Hitler. So, um, Ken, if you'd like to kind of continue on that, uh, on that premise or that position. Well, the basic point that Dawkins and Harris and other pop atheists are making is basically to blame... Nazism and well, all kinds of atrocities throughout history on theism, and then turn around and claim that atheism is as white as snow. I mean, they're completely blameless because nobody ever takes an action based on a lack of belief, is the way they like to put it. Interesting, yeah. Which is, I mean, it that is just logically and philosophically a train wreck to argue both those things. Right. It's remarkable that they can get away with that too. Looking at 20th century history, um, people, admitted atheists, people like, I think Lenin was an atheist, Trotsky, right, Stalin? Yeah, Mao oh, Tse, Stalin, and, um, you know, I when I talk about atheism in relation to the atrocities of the 20th century, I do not count Nazism in there. I kind of have them as a separate entity. And what, for um, what reasons? What's, what's the rationale? Just because I don't feel comfortable outright concluding that Hitler was an atheist, you know what I mean? Right. I would definitely say, as we've reviewed, he's definitely an anti-Christian, um, but more of a social Darwinist. Right, he made those statements over and over again, you know? Yeah, struggle, I mean, struggle, was, struggle, struggle, struggle. Yeah, there's a point in, a, in the book where I quote... Darwin, and I quote Hitler, and I falsely attribute the quotes to the wrong person, and then I tell you, oh, I accidentally, which I didn't, it was on purpose, right. I put the wrong name on the quotes. Why? Because you can't tell them apart anyway. They're saying the same thing, which is not, by the way, to say that, um, you know, I mean, obviously Darwin died long before Hitler came around, but Hitler and people like him who were attempting to apply evolutionary concepts to humanity uh, were very blunt about what they were saying. Now, the key thing for me uh, when we take the 
atrocities of the 20th century as a whole, is that, yes, within merely a few years, atheists mass-murdered more people than anyone else could have ever hoped to have done. Right. Especially in, fact, in the Soviet he, Union. What's Soviet Union body count? 60 million or 50 million or something? Yeah, I mean, altogether, I've seen, uh, altogether, I mean, everywhere, right? Cambodia, China, Soviet Union, you're talking roughly 200 million. It's just an incredible slaughter, you know. Now, here's the thing, okay? Here, here's what I make sure to emphasize when I discuss this, is those numbers are not people dying in war against other nations. Those deaths are people being mass slaughtered by their own regimes. Right, democide, right? Right. It's not, I mean, the body count from war during that era is a separate issue than the fact that because of their atheistic evolutionary worldviews, these atheist leaders viewed their very own people as, you know, by organism, uh, useless or worthless eaters, right? right? People who are just consuming, and why not just get rid of them? I mean, it's right. better for the rest. In fact, they might not even have seen them as their own people. These are just, like, um, less evolved right. uh, primates. Right. And, right. So I think so the, that, the that, Nazis definitely felt that way, but I think that in these communist, you know, upheavals, they thought that people weren't who weren't supporting... The socialist utopia, those are the ones that had to go, you know. And that was the excuse to get rid of them. So it was kind of like they were lesser. You don't, you're not on with the program? Okay. Psst. You know, purge. Death right. So, so that to me is very significant because these were not soldiers. These were not people fighting battles. These are people literally being mass murdered based on nothing but a worldview philosophy. Right. And, and what I hear back from, quite a few times I've heard back from atheists saying, well, those numbers were just really so high because we've reached a certain level of technology where it made it a lot easier to kill a lot of people at one time. But, um, I mean, what kind of technology exactly does it require to starve people to death? Right. I mean, it actually requires a lack of technology. And, and how much technology does it require to put one bullet inside of one brain and then fill up a mass grave? I mean, no. Sorry. Well, you made a, a really excellent point in your book when you brought in Solzhenitsyn talking about how, you know, there hadn't been mass murders until this, then, and then all of a sudden, you know, Russia was relatively peaceful, and then these cataclysmic slaughters took place, you know, and uh, I thought that he had made, uh, Solzhenitsyn made some amazing points, you know, uh, about that, but yeah. Right, and before him, Friedrich Nietzsche, he had literally predicted that that would happen. Wow, fascinating. I, well, I refer to it as the deicidal prophecies, because Nietzsche, late in the 1800s, saw that with the death of God would come about those sorts of atrocities, point blank. Yeah, it's for, it's, well, and, then, and then you quote Solzhenitsyn saying that that was precisely the reason these mass slaughters took place. He says, here's a quote, And if I were called upon to identify briefly the principal trait of the entire 20th century, here too... I would be unable to find anything more precise and pithy than to repeat once again, men have forgotten God. Right. It's remarkable. And, you know, the interesting thing is when Trotsky took power in southern Russia, the first thing he did is erected a statue of Judas Iscariot um, to taunt all these people and, and show he was an anti-Christian and an atheist. And, and the slaughter is just incredible. And here's another quote, a great quote that you had from Frederick Engels. He writes, Quote, all the other large and small nationalities and peoples are destined to perish before long in the revolutionary world storm. The next world war will result in the disappearance from the face of the earth, not only of reactionary classes and dynasties, but also of entire reactionary peoples. And that, too, is a step forward in history. A step forward. In history, nothing is achieved without violence and implacable ruthlessness. And frankly, one of the things that's disturbing to me is how many atheists I've run across who literally deny history that's as recent as less than 100 years ago. Straight up deny it. That's true. That's I mean, actually it, very common in Russian apologists is they deny the purges and the slaughters and the starvings of the Ukrainians and the killing of the elites and just everything, you know. They just deny it happened. And so what I see is atheists 
constantly arguing that, oh, you don't need God for your ethics. You can just kind of invent your own. And it's like, well, that's a very convenient thing to say when you live on a country that was originally premised on Judeo-Christian principles, and it's a rich country and a safe country, and you have a lot of freedoms. Right. But when you start building up a regime based on the view that you, yes, you, you're just another bioorganism, right. right? You're a hairless ape. You're either um, producing or you're just consuming, and then things get ugly very quickly. It's true. You know, one of the interesting things I see about the Darwinists and the atheists is that they adhere to this idea of the struggle of life over millennia, but, you know, this ruthless struggle or whatever, and then say, you know, they don't have, they don't care about the Christian, like there's a, there's a duality where they say, oh, we can have our own values, even though we believe all life came from accident and struggle. It's very strange. Very strange for me. Right. Because what happens is good becomes evil and evil becomes good because everything that has happened throughout history is for our the betterment of evolution and to producing better creatures and better humans and well that includes a whole lot of death pain and suffering so you're forced to say well that was beneficial yeah that's amazing i mean i even i even have quotations from um sam harris and other very well known and respected atheists who argue that rape played a beneficial role in human evolution right because, I mean, it happened. Obviously, it produces offspring. So then that widens the gene pool. It must be good. I mean, literally, that's, that's, that's the way they, they view that's it. View it right? Okay, so yeah. then we get uh, back to Dawkins. He claims that when it comes to dealing with society and government, he's an ardent anti-Darwinist. Hmm. And I think that's very wise of him, because he knows exactly what would happen with a government that's based on Darwinism. I mean, we've seen it in history, right? right, right. So, but my, my question would be, well, but why? <laughs> if, if that's the way nature works, if that is what drives the engine of evolution, if that is really your worldview, then why would you oppose it? The only thing I can think of is that, as usual, He's begging, borrowing, and stealing from the Judeo-Christian worldview and right. saying, okay, there's some things that are absolutely right and absolutely wrong. Even though, incidentally, if you uh, note the quote that I put on, on the title page... Right. And What's, the to cover, prevent, right. What's to prevent us from saying Hitler wasn't right? I mean, that is a genuinely difficult question. Yeah, and I could see why for Dawkins it would be a difficult question. In fact... Uh, Dawkins has in the past, he's lamented that eugenics got such a bad name, right? right? Because it's a Darwinian, eugenics, right? yeah. eugenics makes a lot of sense, right? Why, why do you want to preserve a bunch of people who can't take care of themselves or, or they have uh, genetic disabilities or mental disabilities? I mean, why? Why put all so much effort into caring for these um, temporarily and accidentally existing organisms? that we call human beings. So he says, you know, it's really too bad that um, eugenics got a bad name because it's a useful concept. Right, from his atheistic, Darwinistic... Well, yeah, sure. Uh, ...worldview, world right. Yeah, it's amazing. I mean, I think that these kind of ideas, these kinds of ideas that are, are going to, you know, end up, you see the Antifa and all of this social... You know, con constructs that comes from people who have this kind of, uh, you know, red outlook. You know, this kind of socialistic, would you say, socialistic, Darwinistic worldview. I mean, I think to yeah, be a communist, you basically are an atheist. You know, r uh, religion is the opiate of the masses, right? So, you know, you just see this this kind of aggressive violence towards socialism. Yeah, and you know, um, okay, time for a joke. Okay, uh, you know, Carrie Fisher, she prayed played Princess Leia on yes. the Star Wars. Mm -hmm. Yeah. She says, um, Mark said religion is the opiate of the masses. I used to do mass amounts of opiates religiously. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah, she was a garbage head, man. She did all kinds of drugs. She was so but um, 
Yeah, you mentioned Antifa, and just today on the way to dinner on the radio, we heard a clip of an interview with a college professor who is basically saying that violence is acceptable as a counteraction to thought. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if you are expressing a point of view that he and people like him find objectionable, it's perfectly acceptable to be violent against you. Just because of what you're saying. It's remarkable. Okay? And now listen to what Sam Harris wrote in The End of Faith in 2005. Some propositions are so dangerous that it may even be ethical to kill people for believing them. Wow. I mean, th that's what we're up against. Right. And, and right. that if you quote that, to certain atheists, they'll go after you for not understanding his wisdom. <laughs> right, right. And his delivery is so, like, uh, middle of the road, passionless. I mean, it's really something else that he, I mean, uh, pro-rape, pro-kill. I mean, it's uh, it's kind of like a sneaking, you know, violence, you know, in those in those terms. Well, yeah, I mean, let me let me qualify something. I, I would not say he's pro-rape. It's He recognizes right. that... Rape in our right. society today, it's not legal or ethical, but he can admit that it had a, its place in human evolution. In fact, he, um, let me quote to you what he said about the Holocaust. Okay. The, gra the gravity of Jewish suffering over the ages, culminating in the Holocaust, makes it almost impossible to entertain any suggestion that Jews might have brought their troubles upon themselves. This, however, in a rather narrow sense, uh, this is, however, in a rather narrow sense, the truth. Okay? So, so why in a narrow sense is that the truth, that they brought the troubles on themselves? I'll get back to that in a second. Okay. I was mentioning that within the context, context of making sure we understand his statements about rape, because he, here he blames the Holocaust on the Jews, and then when Muslim women are raped by non-Muslims, guess who he blames? He blames Muslims. Well, how is, how is that? I didn't know Exactly. That. Yeah. How is that? Well, he says, well, uh, if Islam didn't have such a strong taboo against rape, then Muslim women wouldn't be uh, raped by non-Muslims because the non-Muslims are raping them just to make it almost impossible to, for them to keep functioning normally within the uh, Muslim society. Okay. <laughs> and the, so that's the same thing with the Jews, because the Jews have always had this concept of uh, maintaining their own identity, right? Their right, non-assimilation, right? Right, and that's why. That's why he's saying that. Well, yeah, you guys just, you know, played this non-assimilation game uh, to the point where it became easy to target you. You just made yourself target, so it's your fault. Interesting. That's, that's and this guy else. is a champion of reason in our modern age. <laughs> right, like that's it. It's like a human reason. There it is. It's uninspired, cold, non-empathetic. You know, it's remarkable. You know? I mean, I mean people, a lot of people take him seriously. I read one yeah. of the intros. I think I read the intro to the end of Faith, and I laughed out loud. I think I told you that before. But I like, yeah, literally read a page and a half, and I was like, this is a joke. This is a, this is hysterically has no idea what Christianity actually means. You know, they kind of just it's kind of like you pick and choose your own your own facts and and make up a narrative. And, uh, That's right. Because could could I um, start a a violent, militant, oppressive organization and claim every single day that we're Christians? Sure, I could. Right. Uh, we, we've already talked about yeah, this. He'll do it, it all. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's not obvious enough that people get it. That doesn't mean it is. Right. That, that doesn't mean it is. So I would have to say, well, okay, let me, let me think back. Um, did Jesus do things like this? Uh, no. Okay. Did his apostles? No. no. Did his disciples? No. Did early church leaders? No. Okay. Um, to, to where do we want to go to say, oh, uh, violent depression, that's definitely um, Christian ethics. What? I'm going to have to respond uh, to the Crusades or the yeah, Inquisition. Crusades, I mean, yeah. we're going to have to go historically and culturally so far away from Christianity's founding principles right. that I have to answer for that as if that's as legitimate 
Christianity as is the New Testament Christianity? No. Yeah, yeah I agree. I, in fact, I can condemn those actions on absolute terms where atheists can only condemn them because they feel like it. I mean, that's mm-hmm. just putting it very bluntly. And I'm going to look up a quote if you want to Go for make it. a few statements. Okay. Yeah. Well, I was just going to say that, uh, you know, there's a lot of great information in this book. I definitely recommend the book. The picture on the top shows a propaganda uh, poster that was designed by the Nazis of a Nazi knife going through a Holy Bible. I mean, it's pretty clear. Uh, that's a pretty clear indication that, you know, some this it says this is the enemy. This poster was created by the Office for Emergency Management, Office of War Information. So, I mean, it seems pretty clear that they knew exactly what was happening now imagine a government a u.s government agency nowadays putting out a poster like that i mean they'd get sued by american atheists <laughs> yeah oh that's true that gets a good point yeah so let me I mean, give you an example of why i said the only terms on which atheists could condemn those things is because they feel like it or because they're borrowing judeo-christian ethics um, this is a statement name uh, made by Someone who went by the name of Dave from the ISU Atheist and Agnostic Society. Okay, here's what he says. Okay. Now, this statement is, I consider it the strongest premise upon which an atheist could base condemning anything. And I'm not even kidding. This is the best they got, in my opinion. You'll see why. So he writes, so... Why is Adolf Hitler wrong? Because he murdered millions, and his only justification, even if it were valid, was based on things which he should have known were fault, were factually wrong. Why is it wrong to do that? Because I say so. Wow. Incredible. I'm not even kidding. That's what he wrote. And to me... You know, I love honesty, even when it's that shocking, but that he recognizes, yeah, you know, Hitler should have known better, and he still did it, and why was it wrong for him to do that? Uh, because I say so. That's all I got, because I say so. All right, that's amazing. Of course, the problem now becomes, okay, so now it's good old Dave from a university against um, a horde of neo-Nazis, and let's see who survives that fight. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You know, if the Nazis, yeah, if the Nazis really had kind of uh, adopt all this stuff of Hitler, I would say, you know, it could get get worse. I mean, one, of, yeah, it's amazing. One of the heads of these Nazi groups is a guy who loves Crowley. He's an OTO member. Saul, what's his name? Saul Invictus or something like that. He was at Charlottesville. But mm. uh, yeah, these guys, I I don't know. You know, they get. They get stronger. You never know what could happen. I think that uh, Trump just came out and Ritz actually put something in writing condemning these white supremacy groups, but I haven't read it yet. But, uh, you know, I think we've done about an hour of uh, talking about the book. Is there anything, you know, I don't want to go over anything. I'd highly recommend this book, but is there anything you'd like to talk about that we missed or haven't emphasized? Maybe just review a couple of the the chapter headings just to give a better idea of what's in the book great let's do it because that that's i mean to me the chapter headings are just a lot of food for thought such as that um i do have an entire chapter on the question of whether hitler was a christian or an atheist i mean i, I have an entire chapter on that right yep um, then I have one that I call the uh, deicidal and misanthropic prophecies, and that's the one about Friedrich Nietzsche. How gotcha. absolutely right he was in foreseeing what was going to come in the near future, and it came. Right. Slaughter. Then uh, maybe an odd section, because an atheist, um, I'd have to look to see if it was Harris or not, um, asking if the Holocaust would have happened if Hitler had been a Buddhist. So then I go into the Buddhist worldview and how that has been applied towards, for example, the Bushido Code. And yeah, of course, I mean, you have entire clans of warriors based on Buddhism, not to mention the kamikazes. 
But, but of course, when you get into that, you get into the same issue you get into by claiming that Hitler was an evolutionist or a social Darwinist, which is the claim that, oh, no, well, you know, Hitler was misinterpreting uh, Darwin or evolution. Um, well, for one, I would like to see if, if Hitler or, or me, if I'm misrepresenting evolution, well, can someone show me the theory of evolution? I mean, I would like to see it. Where is it? And you find out, well, there is no one theory of evolution. There's just thousands upon thousands of books and papers written describing theories, plural, of evolution. So I'm not sure how it can be said point blank that Oh, you're misrepresenting evolution. Now, if you want to say that you are misrepresenting the specific writings of the one author, Charles Darwin, then maybe you you got something because at least he has books that you can point to and look at and quote. Right. And then also it's a question of application, right? Because let's say that Darwin's main concern was biological evolution but then came the social Darwinist, and they started applying his theory and widening it so that all of a sudden it becomes a literal worldview. That's what it becomes. It becomes economics is about evolution, right? Right, it, everything, right. Uh, society, politics, everything, uh, you know, military uh, wars, everything is about evolution on that view. And so that is part of the argument that I've also had with atheists, which is that when I refer to an atheist worldview philosophy, they deny that atheism is a worldview. By the way, in The God Delusion, Richard Dawkins claims that atheism is a worldview. Interesting. So he's, for some reason, hmm. go ahead. No, he said publicly that it, that it isn't and written privately or in the book that it is. Is he inconsistent? Mm, well, no, publicly... <laughs> Publicly, he actually denies that he has personally ever claimed to be an atheist. Fascinating. Unfortunately, I have video of him claiming to be an atheist. <laughs> no, that doesn't, so Unfortunately, it's inconsistent, for him. right? Yeah. But no, um, I'm just saying that in his book, he states outright that atheism is a worldview. But I have tons of individual atheists, not Dawkins, individual atheists complaining to me or are counter arguing that atheism is not a worldview. So let me spend a minute on that. Okay. So they would say it is not a worldview because there's no uh, systematized, coherent set of atheist beliefs about everything, right? Like morality and uh, aesthetics and society and what have you. In other words, the, the, there's no systemized, uh, systemized concept for an atheist to all point to and say, yeah, that's us. We all believe that. Uh, well, I mean, to me, that's a bit of a mischaracterization of a worldview, because, of course, uh, for instance, you and I, William, we're both Christians. We both hold to a Christian worldview. That doesn't mean that we agree on absolutely everything, because right. what a worldview turns out to be, it's a core Right, it's a it's a it's a premise, it's a fundamental assumption, it's a presupposition in a way. Uh, they're kind of like the glasses you put on your face, and then so everything that you see is filtered through that worldview, which right. is the core. So that let's say that um, when you think about the things I mentioned, aesthetics, ethics, politics, all of those would be filtered through that core worldview. And they become part of your worldview once you systematize them accordingly. So that let's say tomorrow we might learn something brand new. Maybe we discover a new planet or a new species of insect. That would be something that was not in our worldview because we didn't know about it. Well, now we learn about it and we systematize it by filtering it through, understanding it through our worldview. Right. All right. So what I, um, very simply, what I've, devised is just a question to ask atheists. It's like, okay, well, if atheism is not a worldview because it is merely 
one opinion on one issue, which is the issue of God's existence, then tell me, where in any area of your thinking do you make place for an actually existing God? And when the answer is, in no area whatsoever, I go, well, there, you got yourself a worldview that's atheistic. Right. Right? right? When there is absolutely no place in any part of your thinking about anything for an actually existing God, then that means atheism is your worldview because you are viewing absolutely everything through your atheistic presupposition. Right. So there you have it, and, and I got into that because of talking about Buddhism, and is it misinterpreted when it's used to justify um, military actions? Well, is evolution or Darwinism misinterpreted? Is Christianity misinterpreted? And So it's, it's interesting to get into these issues. Agreed. I definitely agreed. <clears throat> then, uh, um, please continue. One, yeah. One chapter I have... I call it um, what the Richards, that's Richard Smith and Richard Dawkins, didn't bother mentioning because I found it interesting when um, Dawkins is playing off of the claims of uh, Richard Smith. Um, boy, I noticed so many things they didn't bother mentioning. And it, what it does is it makes their arguments very self-serving and convenient because they're only telling the parts of the story that make them seem as if they're correct. But if you know better, then you know, boy, there's so much they're not mentioning it that actually topples their claims. Interesting. And, and why... I have a... Go ahead, please continue. Yeah, then um, I do have a section on showing the anti-Christian nature of Nazism, um, such as the de-Jewification of the Bible, as the Nazis called it, and the establishment of, of Nazi Reich churches, uh, which just make it absolutely clear. I mean, right. if Christianity was basically to them... Um, it's just something uh, to be used, yeah. It was like an implement tool. Just something tool, to yeah. be used yeah. and something that had been so misdefined and redefined that if they were to call themselves Christians, um, that would mean something absolutely foreign to any traditional Christian that has lived throughout the right. past 2,000 years. And I think that was part of their thing, is just to uh, syncretize it with Nazism and turn it into Nazism, you know? I mean, you talk, I mean, you talk about, I think there was a thing in there about Alfred Rosenberg, arguably the ideologue, one of the main ideologues in the Third Reich, you know, just just going in and manipulating these churches and changing them to, you know, changing them to under the power of the Nazis. And, uh, yeah, it's incredible. Yeah, the, um, I review part of the, the, the whole history of their, their, of the different things that the Nazis were doing to try to just completely take over Christianity and I'm not the first one who thinks that had the Holocaust gone on much longer than the actual traditional genuine Christians would have been next into the gas chambers. Yeah, I think you're right. I think that that's where they were headed. They were throwing the Seventh Day Adventists in the in the uh, camps, and you know, people who right. spoke out. And I mean, they and cut, that's something you know. that's something that to me, as a Jew, right? As I mean, I, I'm a Christian, but I'm a Jew. Uh, also, to me, it's, it is important to, to say, remember, it wasn't just the Jews were the main focus of the Holocaust, but basically anybody, absolutely anybody that got in the way of Nazism got the similar treatment. Well, they, they, weren't, they didn't even throw the Polish intellectuals and the ruling class into a camp. They just systematically killed them all. So if you were anything on the upper crust of Polish aristocracy, they just murdered all of them and turned, tried to turn Poland into Lebensraum, you know. And uh, so, and they obviously weren't very nice to the Russians. One eighth of the entire population of Russia was murdered. So there was just murder everywhere. It was incredible. And even though, I mean, you know, the light, Night of the Long Knives in what, 1933, presaged right, right. further for murders, you know? I mean, solidified Hitler's power, destroyed all the records, killed a thousand people, and, 
you know, Hitler was uncontested from there on. What was the Reichstag fire? Was that 33 too? I don't remember. I'm sorry? When was the Reichstag fire? Do you remember what year that was? Oh, the fire, uh, I don't off the top of my head. Uh, it was 1933 too, so the Reichstag happened, blame it on the communist, and then, um, Night of the Long Knives. And yeah, I have a, an entire section here uh, from quotations from different communist leaders just stating outright, yeah, this is why we're doing it. Because of natural selection, because of evolution, because of materialism. That's what it's based on. I mean, they were very open about why they were doing what they were doing. Just yeah. very straight up. It's based on worldview. Yeah, your yeah. worldview matters. And yes, it motivates your activities. Yeah. Right. Or no in German, the Weltanschauung. The Weltanschauung, yeah. right? They had their own uh -huh. nifty little word for, world for it, and that was it. Lebensraum, inferior, superior races, survival of the fittest, you know. It's bad. Yeah, in fact, I, a long time ago, I posted an article about Dawkins, and I called it Zeitgeist Weltanschauung. Right, yeah, because right. his worldview is based on the concept of the spirit of the age, which means that um, what is what was immoral yesterday could be moral today. What was, and vice versa. Right. Right, because it, it's constantly changing. Which, right. by the way, um, I came up with a nifty little phrase, which is that atheism discredits condemnation. And condemnation discredits atheism, because if, if your if your worldview tells you that morality evolved, and by the way, I, I've had many atheists tell me that, and, and pay attention to the tense, it evolved the past right. tense. Right. Well, who told you it stopped evolving? First of all, so we'd have to say morality is evolving. Okay. But then we don't know to where it is evolving, right? Because it's a blind process. And so unless we human beings are able to control other human beings well enough to force them to do what we want, then um, this zeitgeist, this spirit of the age, is just kind of um, taking us along and things are changing so that how can atheists condemn actions recorded in the Bible. If, hey, back then, that was moral. You have no right to say, because today that's immoral, then we get to condemn the past. That's just illegitimate based on their worldview. I mean, whatever happened to this concept of um, evolving morality? The best they should say if they're logical thinkers, and I mean consistent logical thinkers, is... Well, you know, today that's immoral, but back then it was moral. Oh, well, can't, you know, as long as it's not happening today, we really can't say anything about it. We can't judge it, can't condemn it, right? Right. I mean, if you're going to be consistent, if morality changes, well, then you have no right to complain about what happened in the past when something that you today say is immoral, well, back then they were saying it was moral. So there you go. You've just discredited your ability to condemn but the fact that atheists do go on condemning merely proves that, guess what? Because they're made in God's image, God has written his law in their hearts, and that's why they feel the need to run around condemning so many things, because they have that sense that God placed within them, that right. ethic. That, right. Yeah. Good point. It's a great point. Anything uh, you want to say before we wrap it up? Anything uh, to talk about the book? which I highly recommend, from Zeitgeist to Poltergeist. Just to say, I mean, I've attempted to, in a manner that I hope is user-friendly and that it's readable and um, easy to read. It's only, what, like 160 pages? Yeah. I, I tried the best I could to hit as many topics as I could. Like I said, everything from atheism to Christianity to to evolution and Darwinism, to the to what Hitler personally believed and what was said about him, 
and uh, just a you know a bit of the historical context, a bit of the cultural context. So kind of like a um, simplification of a lot of very complex issues. Well, it's definitely a superb book. I highly recommend it. From Zeitgeist to Poltergeist, Kenemy, thank you very much for being on the show. Thank you for having me on again. All right, cool. All right, man, we're good. We went for a good, what was it, 25, 40, 65 minutes. That's pretty good. Nice.